Yeah. Uh, it kind of that is in my heart for many, many years. And it comes along with one of these beautiful scripture that describes and this is Psalm 91. And Psalm 91 is a pretty long song. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read a few verses. And that describes a life of someone that is untouched. It is really one of my favorite uh, songs because I just love to be that person. The kind of person that it describes here is magnificent. And to me, they have that untouchable. Right. Psalm 91, where you can flip on your electronic or paper. Today, I'll read at home with our the paperback uh, book, Bibles, my wife's. So we have draw back, you know, we draw back a long way just to get that paper home. I say, we can flip that electronic one the same, but she's trying to set an example. We're back to the tradition. Actually, we're not trying to back to the We're trying to honor the, the Bible a little bit more, right? But we see this. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that awesome? I really want to live there. There's no other place greater than that. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in whom I trust. Surely we will save you. He will save you from the flower snare and from the deadly pestilence. Pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness, faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terrors of night, nor the arrows that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stop in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. And that's how beautiful a life it is being described here. Any one of you who doesn't want to be that, you know, would be a fool, I think. Everybody wants to be the untouchable. Nothing's going to harm you. You don't worry about the sickness. You know, it's going to come, you know, trying to snatch you away, trying to hurt you, to play, or whatever. You'll be protected. You're the pupil of his eyes. And nobody dare to touch the pupil of God's eyes, right? And you won't let people touch your pupil too, right? Unless you guys do these eyeglasses, you know, things. You're always touching your people. You get used to it. But for those who are not used to using that eye contact lens stuff, it's really sensitive. So imagine we are the pupils of his eyes. Who can dare to touch? Who can touch us? We are under so much protection. So this is what I'm going to talk about is how can we be somebody you know, that dwells in the, in, in the sh shadows of the Almighty. And the Bible tells us that whoever loves him will follow his word. And those that follow his word, his father will love him. And I will also appear to him. So you can see that when you say love God, everybody say love God. What is loving God? Loving God is following his words. And sometimes we're not so clear about the words. So we're doing a lot of things that we thought is the word of God, but it's not really the will of God. So it's very important to become absolutely clear and understanding how the word is guiding us to be. Because the word is guiding us to be somebody, eventually, to be the untouchable. Because if you're walking in the will of God, the presence of God it will be around you. No, only, you only get one in the trouble when you're out of the will of God. But what is the will of God? The will of God is clearly written in his word. Those that follow on his words will be in the will of God. Right? So, it's an important thing. Somebody, uh, uh, I'm so glad uh, now the young people in the broader school, they're all like, excited about the word of God. It was such a surprise, and uh, it was such a surprise how they demand and asking to know more about the knowledge of God and the Bible and stuff. Then I, I was really happy. I was thinking that if people ask me why is it so important to be good with the Word of God, it's because if you're good with the Word of God, 
and you can do, you can start walking truly in his will, you know it, and then you can become this untouchable. So, today I'm going to you know, elaborate on that. What is a good thing about being, being the uh, untouchable? The first thing is definitely, you know, you're untouchable, no, nothing can harm you, right? You're totally living in his presence. And then also, you can have a, the second thing is, you will have a heavenly perspective, right? You start seeing things differently because you're high up there, you're not just like a little cow eating on the ground, but right? you're the eagle that's flying in the air. And the last thing is, you have the power to give life. And you have this kind of charisma that exudes from you, that is just better than good look, you know? I know that good look is very important, good body, but there is some kind of charisma, it's a spiritual charisma that is so magnetic and fascinating. And that's why when Jesus was walking on earth, he was telling some of the people, you know, doing changes, money changes, he would say, oh, come, come follow me. And they immediately dropped everything and followed Jesus, right? You know, remember the gospel? Imagine that kind of charisma there. If somebody comes over to you, hey, quick your job, follow me, right? This guy had to be hell of a good looking. And he's like, I can totally trust him. He's just like so solid, he's not like a normal person. He comes to you like, whoa, no, come follow me, right? <laughs> so you can feel that kind of charisma. Of, of course, it's not being described in the Bible, but I'm very sure Jesus doesn't walk and talk and act like a normal person. A normal, you know, John or something. What do you call that normal people name? John Doe. Okay. He talks with this kind of charisma, and this charisma is basically a spiritual power because it's, it can en enable him to give life. And he's talking about spiritual life, and that's a very attractive thing. So, I assume you all want to be untouchable. And after today's sermon, I really want you to put you all into this category. So you can be sad, understand that we are the untouchable in the hands of God. We are the people on the side. We are that important. Nothing really can harm us, nothing really can touch us unless God's allowed for us for trial or for testing. Okay? So uh, I will really start talking about the heart of worship. Because that is where the untouchable. Those people, they dwell in that place. They're dwelling in the heart of worship. And what is the first time God introduced the concept of worship? It's the Ten Commandments. Is it what? Ten Commandments? The law? Yes. You know, all this whole thing about Mount Sinai, with people coming over, and God is giving this Ten Commandments, and all this stuff. It's, it's not like God wants to start ruling you, okay? So let me set something straight. In my house, you do this. It's not that. that the idea is not that. God is basically... It's all about worship. God is setting forth a path so this, to his people, to the people that cross the Red Sea. And because we are saved, so now gather together. Now, God is telling you guys, this is how I like you to serve me. This is how, the way I am. This is what I want. This is what I don't want. And this is the way you come into union with me and serve me. And this is the heart of worship. So don't look at Mount Sinai as something very, very straight and cold. Like, you know, law is a hard, cold thing, right? It's nothing, it's, nothing, it's nothing passionate. Law is hard. When you think of law, you would think of something stern, you know, rigid, right? But no, when God passed out the Ten Commandments, what he's trying to do is, I'm telling you, this is the way to please me. This is the way to come into worship me. And it's a corporate a corporate kind of worship. Uh, I know Abraham worship, you know, and whoever know, uh, know what worship. But now this is Sinai. It's God said, if you guys want to gather together and worship me, this is the way I want it. So this is the setting. And it's such a long, Exodus uh, chapter 13 is a long chapter. So when you go home, you'll read about it. And you can understand. And actually, after you reach Exodus chapter 13, 19, you also can read uh, the Hebrews, right? The book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And that is talking about in the New Testament, we are still coming to the Mount Sinai. And it's really, really magnificent, right? And God is a consuming fire. And it doesn't mean that in the past he was a very awesome God and now he is all careless. But this is even more serious. 
There's a thousand angels surrounding us, right? And we are the, the courtship of the elders. So this is something, this is one of the chapters you really should, uh, especially those who are really care about worship, you, know, you really have to get into it. Because that's the whole setting about worship. This is the first time God is gathering up his people and telling the guy how to have meeting, how to have church meeting. And, you know, the first thing they do is they have to camp around the, the mountain for three days. So it's not like, a, so, okay, let's go, you know, let's get into the temple of God. You know, three days you camping. The camping is a preparation time. So you can camp, you can wait upon the Lord and get yourself all ready, right? You got to get your heart ready when you come to church. Right? You should, I don't need you to have three days to get prepared, but at least you should have three hours. When you wake up this morning, you, know, you start thinking, okay, today's Sunday. You know, don't go doing, don't play video games or, or do, read some kind of stupid book or something like that, right? Drop everything because it needs a preparation time before you come into the presence of God. And then when God said to Moses, okay, tell them to wash all their clothes, you know, because God doesn't like you wearing dirty clothes, right? They have three days to wash themselves clean, wash their clothes, get themselves all ready, and then uh, most of them say uh, no sexual activities, you know. I'm not saying that sexual activity is bad or sinful, but it's like everything that is not related to worship, just refrain from it, right? So you can, you can tell it's a very serious setting. And God makes it very serious just to let us know it is very serious. And the book of Hebrews is reminding us just for some of you that forgets that it's so serious for a meaning, I'm telling you, in the spiritual realm, it's really, the dimension is very, very awesome. So it's us, us, us here, the dirty people gathering here and listen to me talk. It's basically this whole Mount Sinai experience. God speaks, right? In a, let, me, let me read to you. And you read with me in your heart, okay? And try to picture, picture yourself that you're there. And this is what happened. Verse 10. Right? I just picked the, here's a long chapter. I'm just going to pick a few chapters. Verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are, they are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may, the, may they approach the mountain. So you don't just come into the court of God casually, right? You really have to wait. You really have to follow the law, the order. Right? If you if it's really an end animal, if Rexy was there, that's why they don't pick, usually they don't pick that put pets. They don't allow pet, pet into the sanctuary because you know the traditional Christian. They, are, they were hope, they were afraid that the pet may get smite. It's from this kind of scripture, right? Because even if, if you have a pet that's no rexy ridicule, coming near the mountain, has to have to stomp to death. And if he's too fast running around, we have to shoot him with the arrows. Right? Yes, all of you stepped off. Said, no, God is not that mean. Actually, he is pretty mean. Okay. It's just have we have a power of mercy and grace and cover his. Okay, and then after Moses gone down, they, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud, cloud over the mountains and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camps to meet the meet of God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it with, in fire. That's really a really awesome thing, right? And God doesn't make a casual entrance. God comes in like, boom. This is God Almighty talking, right? And then the, 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 the smoke billows, billows up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, people were really, really scared. Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. So they come over here, and they're not just listening to Moses. They're basically listening to God. 
And when Moses speaks, they can hear God talks through Moses. Now that's the setting of this pulpit. That's why it's really scary. Right? For those who are going to preach soon, and I'm telling you this is very serious stuff, really awesome stuff. Because like last time we talked about pulpit, it's not just for me to share my view, point of view, you know, share something that is in my heart. You know. Basically, when you stand up here, you're responsible to carry out what God is wanting to tell us to accomplish. So this whole setting is really, really a phenomenal thing. And the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their ways to, to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. The priest is talking about the, the elders, the, the people that really serve in the church, for those, right? Like a worship and all this stuff. So when you come up here, just because you're a priest, do not think you can take it lightly. Because the Lord may break out against you. He said, well, that's the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament. No, but the book of Hebrew tells us, you know, the warning of the Old Testament by people is really serious. Now you really have to take it serious from the warning from heaven. It's from above. So I, I want you to, I want to paint you this very, very serious picture about service, about worshiping God. Because wherever the presence of God is there, it is not to be taken lightly, right? So everything has to be followed. And then <clears throat> God comes with his ten commandments. The, can I have some clean next? Somewhere. Oh, okay. The first commandment, uh, the first ten commandment thing is called uh, uh, apodetic law. It means it's absolute law. The Ten Commandments is absolute law. There is no give, if, or, or but. It's like thou shalt and thou shalt not. And sadly to say, a lot of Christians would not be able to remember the Ten Commandments. How many of you think if I pass the pen and pencil right now, that you can read right down the Ten Commandments? Oh, pretty good. Yeah. But this is like serious law now. This is not like. A lot like the, uh, they have this, it's called casuistic law, a whole bunch of them, like 600 of them. And this is like, if you do this, if it happened to owe somebody this, you should pay him this. If you happen to break something, you should really pay, we pay this. If you do this, that's like an if or that's right sometimes. It's a conditional law. But this Ten Commandment is an unconditional law. No condition to it. So that means Sunday comes and you're supposed to go to church, right? And, but, the four nine is playing right now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not even bad, right? The Sabbath is the Sabbath. That's why I really wanted to look at the, the, the football game this morning. Nine o'clock, it's not nine o'clock. But I was really scared, especially when I was preaching this. <laughs> but anyway, God doesn't let me have my TV. If I know that my TV, you know, doesn't have a channel to watch sport. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're not subscribing to this channel thing. So anyway, I can't even watch what I I can go to the radio and go to my car and turn it on, but I don't get to do that either. But the thing is, the point is, okay, because it's fall under the Sabbath, and Sabbath is a apodetic, apodictic, apodictic law, unconditioned. And if you really want to study theology, you'll find out if you are the leaders of the house, like the man of the house, right, whether it's the parents of the house, you're responsible uh, by the Old Testament to bring all your children and all your servants into church on Sunday. If you fail to do that, and that means you fail on your responsibility, that means you're sinning against God. So that makes it hard, right? And that's why some of the Christian law ties in, well, you really cannot marry a non-Christian because if they're non-Christian, they they're not ruled by this law. And the kids would not be ruled by this law, right? You may not be, have the, the power to bring, but if both parents are Christian, they can bring the kids to church. But if one parent is not a Christian, the kid can say, I don't want to take it to the Lord's name in vain. And then the fourth one is the Sabbath. You know, we, we've been talking about the Sabbath a lot. And uh, so the, the, the fifth, starting from the fifth, is not talking about the relationship. Relationship between uh, you and other people. But first four is talking about your relationship with God. 
So I'm not, I'm not going to preach a sermon upon the relationship, but I just want to touch on certain things because I think that uh, with the Chinese tradition, there's a lot of tradition that's going against the law of God. So uh, in Chinese tradition, there's a, a statement saying that if I have a lot of sun, it will take care of my, my elders' years. You don't need fall low. Like if I have a lot of kids, I, I'll take care of them when I'm old. So is that biblical? Is that statement? It's more or less biblical. So let's look at uh, Psalm 127, verse 3. I read to you. Psalm 127, verse 3. I guess this is where they come from. A lot of Chinese churches, they love this statement. They always say this to their kids. Verse 3. Okay. Sons are a heritage from, from the Lord. Children a reward from Him. So I say that, yeah. You guys are the children, the kids are my heritage, right? It's like I have a lot of possession. It's almost like a possession, right? Heritage is like something I inherit. It's something that is, you know, the more kids are married, by that saying, right? By that saying, the more kids are married, right? If you have no kids, then where is your heritage, right? So this is a Chinese concept. And that's why a lot of uh, parents will say, okay, uh, now you're growing up, you're making money, you have to bring home a certain amount of money. Like some of your parents still does that. You have to pay me like fifty dollars from the phone. And we we giving giving the parents the money, probably even more than we give God the, the time. Okay, and we always like have to pay mom and dad. And sometimes even though some of you forget to pay Thai, and uh, you still will not forget to pay your mom and dad because your mom and dad will be bugging you. Right? Hey, what's this? This is my friend. Right? So it's not bad to take care of your mom and dad. Sorry. But as a mom and dad. Should you or should you demand the kids because the Bible said that they're the heritage? What do you think? Okay. Let's look at other, other scripture. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it has a lot more explanation about the situation. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, yes, 14. So, now I'm ready to visit you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you, because what I want is not your possessions, but you. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. So I will very gladly spend for you everything I have, and expend myself as well. Now, this is a very, very uh, heart-touching uh, concept that Paul has for his children, his spiritual children, right? Paul, Paul doesn't have this, his physical children, but he has a lot of spiritual children. But this concept is the same. As a parent to children, if you can understand this Second Corinthians, this chapter uh, 12, if this scripture, this scripture is really into your heart, you know how to be a good parent. What is a good parent? A good parents would never want to burden the children, right? I never want to burden you. Because uh, if my son makes a lot of money and he gives his money, okay, to honor me, I'm happy. But if my son doesn't have that much money and he needs to do something and you know, you just took him away his spare money, he can't even buy a nice car, he cannot even live himself, and I'm taking money from him, from him, or maybe I can cut down my house or do something that I don't have to burden my kids. Why I don't want to burden my kids? Because I want my kid to serve God. If he, he was being burdened so he cannot serve God as much, then it comes back to me. It's my problem. So the whole idea is not about you or your kids. That's why the heritage. When we talk about the heritage in Psalm 127, it's not talking about money. It's not a possession of money. Because Paul said, it's not the money that I want from you, right? What I want is not your possession, but you. I want you to be a man of God. I want you to, be, to become something that is fruitful. Because I'm looking at you, if you love God, that's what I want. That's my whole desire. It's not your possession. It's not talking about money. So the heritage, the word heritage, in Psalm 127, it's not about possession. It's not about money. It's about, you know, I have somebody to, 
to, to, to rise up you know, and shine even brighter than I. So in China, there's a concept for many, many thousand years. It's called Mong Ji Sing Long. It's like if you, you know, Ming Sing Hi Fu Mo means like if, if the sons and daughters are really like uh, uh, famous, right, doing something great, then the father and mother will be proud. But in the Christian point of view, I won't be proud unless you really love God. If you love God a lot, even though you're not famous, I'm very proud. Right? And if you, if you don't love God and you're really, really like, like famous, I won't be that proud. Because we see things different. We have a different value concept. So right here, Paul says that well, the parents should save up money for you. So how many, how many of you parents does that? Some of you does that, right? You're so blessed, that, right? For parents to save up money for you. And then, but you don't have to save up money for the parents. So it's not telling you that, oh, you should not take care of your parents, right? Like some of the mom is in a really tough situation, and if you are, if you are sons and daughters, you make money, you really want to help out the mom. You really should help out the mom. Because the Bible said you should take care of your family too, right? You have to take care of your family. Don't talk about God. Just take care of your family. But in the same token, as a parent, you do not want to put this kind of demand onto your kids. Like you have to bring home certain money. Now, if your mom has no one to take her to no one take her to hospital, you take her to the hospital. But it's biblical to say that the heritage means I take care, I have I have uh, children, and when I'm old, okay, the children will come and take care of my welfare, my well-being. It's like when I have needs, they will come and take care of me. And that's why, if you read carefully, the read Psalms one twenty-seven, read the whole chapter at the end. It's all talking about. If I have a son, right, I will be like, uh, I have arrows in my, you know, I have arrows in my hand. Arrows mean my son can always help me a little bit. So, that's kind of, I'm not talking about relationship today, but I want to draw this uh, idea across. It's like God gave you this law, and four of them is to him. So he set, he set the law very straight that he is the center, right? He is the only thing, the, the ultimate thing in your life and in your children's life. And you should try your best to bring your children, affect your children to love God. If, if they're very successful and they don't love God, you still, it's still your problem, right? Because you want to set a good example. So, and then the relationship will set right. If you don't set the relationship with God right, then the relationship will not be set right. That's why the Chinese concept, the, the parents, uh, the, par the ideas of our parents are very stern because they are like the head of the house. They are like the lord of the house, especially for the guy. But in Christian, the Lord is the lord of the house. Right? Jesus is the lord of the house. So we all following his rule to love, and then all the relationships is going to flow into place. Maybe, uh, maybe one of these... Uh, side meeting that we have, you know, the brother and sister meeting, we can go deeper into the relationship between what, what is the responsibility and a biblical way for children, for youngsters to, to, to do, you know, to how to you know, treat the parents and how parents should treat the kids. But the idea is, Ten Commandments comes down is so that we can walk in the path of worship. It's really important. If you don't know the Word of God clearly, then your path, your walk is really kind of like fuzzy too, because his his word is, is the light of our world on our path, right? So you want his word to really shine what exactly what he means, what exactly what's matter, what's the Bible really is talking about, telling us to do. And that is the path of worship. So don't look at law in the sense of like, oh okay, this is something that I must follow, otherwise God is gonna slap me, right? God is not that mean. Look at law in a way that this is the way introduction from God, telling us this is the way that he'll be pleased. This is the way to worship him. This is the way to live in the heart of worship. And living in the heart of worship is dwelling in the, in the shadows of the Most High. Okay? The second point that I'll bring across is you will have a heavenly perspective. So in 2 King. In 2 King, it's talking about a servant of Elijah. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, 
An army with horses and chariot has surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Now that's a heavenly perspective. So if you don't see it, if you just if your eyesight is so shallow, you only see, you know, what's going on. Why you see a good and bad thing happens around you. You don't see what's happening in the spirit. But if you have a heavenly perspective, if your spiritual eye is open, and you see, ooh, behind it, it's like, it's like chariots of uh, horses and and uh, and uh, army, whole army. Actually, not everyone would have that many chariots uh, and horses around them. Right? Don't think that every Christian would have so many around you. But if you're in a spiritual warfare, right, you will be. And it all depends on your ministry. The greater your ministry, the greater more warfare you will you will. Uh, you will face because the greater your ministry, the greater hit you will, you know, impose onto the on the demonic side. So of course the devil is going to fight back. He's not going to lay back and roll over, pray dead, right? He's going to come on you. But this guy is really hurting us, right? They will post up all these nails in hell and say, "Okay, go attack," and then they will all come to you, and so you have a, a huge army surrounding you, trying to get you. And of course, you, you don't have to doubt about it. God is going to send more, right? And I, sometimes I feel sad for the devil because they were saying that every time when we fight, we're always, you know, fighting more than we have to fight. You know, now when you watch a movie, usually the heroes, the good guy, they will be the lesser number, right? Like, oh, 10 against 50, right? Something like that. Always like that. The good is always a lesson, lesser number. But in the spiritual thing, it's always different. The spiritual side, God always had more. Well, you send 100. 1,000 people to try to hurt Priscilla. Okay, let's send the 10,000 troops trip down there. No, they were all fighting. And the devil will always sell the short hand side. Because there's nobody. Point, the, guy, the point is, I said, nobody can touch the people somehow. If you dwell, if you're untouchable, you're dwelling in his presence, you know, there is no war. Actually, when we talk about the holies of holy, there is never, you can never hear like saw and, 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 the, and the sounds of saw and war in the Holy of Holy because the presence of God is so awesome. That's why when we talk about Psalms 91, it's good to be untouchable. The higher up there, you don't really hear spiritual warfare that much. I don't hardly, I hardly go against a lot of spiritual warfare. Like some of the charismatic people, they always go to spiritual warfare every other day, you know. And they have to pray and fast. And I don't have to do that. Why? Because I think I'm living in Psalms 19, 91. You know, I'm, in the, in, I'm dwelling in his presence. And he always has more chariot of fire surrounding me. So in Psalm 127, if you read the first uh, chapter, uh, verse 1 and verse 2, is that unless the Lord is watching over, you know, unless the, the Lord is building a house, you're building it in vain. Unless the Lord is watching over something, you're watching over in vain. So what it's saying is the spiritual side and the physical side. In the physical side, I would say, oh, I'm going to do something. I'm going to start doing something. But if you don't have an old spiritual eyes to see, unless God is doing it, it's not going to happen. So you can say, okay, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna start making more money. This is a physical thing. I'm going to start making more money. But if you open up a spiritual eyes, Unless God wants you to, He's helping you to make more money, you are not going to make more money. And I'm going to really teach, teach Matea to be a good girl, and I'm going to protect him. I don't want anything to help. But if, if Jacks, you know, I'm sure they did, and they, they look at the spiritual thing, they see, oh, God is protecting Matea. If God is not protecting Matea, you can protect Matea all you want, and she's going to turn and become a bad kid. That's nothing you can do if God is not doing it. You can find this kind of concept through the entire Bible. But this is like a heavenly perspective that a lot of people will not see. They will not see. You know, uh, I was really amazed about this. Madden Gone. She is a, a very, very devoted uh, mystical master, right? Christian. And then her husband is not a Christian. 
So every time when she read the Bible, the husband will beat her up. And when she pray, find her praying, the husband will beat her up, right? And this is a physical thing, it's horrible, right? Horrible for, for a husband to beat a woman, beat the wife up. But she said that, oh, I know the hand that smite me is the hand of God. So I kiss and I love the hand that hates me. Wow, that is so awesome, you know? It's like the husband is hurting me, but because I don't see the husband, I don't just see the husband. I see my husband is the hands of God. So it's the hands of God that is hurting me. Of course, I go there and kiss and love the hands of God. So the more the husband beat her up, the more she loves the husband. Emotionally speaking. It's all about the seeing. Isn't that hard to see? It's very hard to see. If somebody hurts you, you know, you see that person, you open your wide eyes, yes, I remember you, you know, you know what that hurts me. You're not going to see behind it all, yeah, that's the hand of God, you know, praise the Lord. You know, this is, there's this horse, Jack was talking about a white elephant, but in China there's this horse called a thousand mile horse, Chinima, and this is the horses from the king. And the king, you know, will honor you, you know, and have you, okay, I give you this horse. And because you're good. But you take care of my horse for me. If my king wants to use it, the horse will come back to the king. So this guy takes this, this, this thousand miles horse, right? Really, really expensive, with like red blood uh, color, so gorgeous. But this kind of horse is really hard to treat because they only eat fresh green grass. How can you find fresh green grass all year round, right? In winter times comes, you know, there's no fresh green grass. And the horse will not eat. Because the only thing he eats is that fresh green grass. Has to be fresh. Has to be green. And then there's nothing green for him. You try to feed him all kinds of stuff, he will not eat. He will just throw up. So he would rather die and he would not eat. And that guy was really scared because if I stop this horse and if something happened to this horse, all my whole family will be, will be beheaded. So he's really worried. What can you do? So this guy is very smart. He finds this rice paper, you know, the rice paper, and he want to mix it. A color of blue. So he put it, put eyeglasses onto this 1,000 mile horse. And the horse is looking at the, the yellow, you know, dry grass. You know, the blue and the yellow comes together on the screen. So the horse is eating it. And this is a real story, okay? This is a real story from a China. Uh, talking about how smart Chinese people are. <laughs> but truly, if you have, if you don't see certain thing, it's totally green, right? But if somebody put a Blue, uh, blue contact lens in you without you knowing it, you will see the yellow green because you have a blue inside you, right? And if you know about mixing of color, uh, you will understand this concept. So, spiritual is the same as the same thing. If you don't see the spiritual thing, what you see will influence how you're going to act. That's why a prophet will have a different mindset than the normal people. Because you see things differently, right? So uh, we decided, I've decided, actually I don't even care about your feedback. I'm decided to like feeding you guys like 10 minutes of prophetic training, doing the brother or sister group, right? So I think you guys should, you two groups should really join. Right? I think joining is better, at least for that 10, 10 minute session. So I don't want you to be, I don't, I'm not pushing you to become like prophet or whatever. Because in the Old Testament, the God only speaks to the prophet. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is inside all Christians, and there's an anointing inside you that will guide you and talk to you. That is the voice of God. I want you to be more keen about how to hear that voice of God. And I want you to start understanding the vision. I want you to start understanding your dreams. And I want you to how to tune in your vision and dream so it's not just you, okay? But it's seeing something that God is saying to you. Because this is all this prophetic training will do, okay? I hope it won't bore you guys too much, but I think it's absolutely necessary. So I am not even asking for your permission. We should really have started having. Next time, next uh, two weeks later, we're gonna have a 10 minute session about prophetic dimension. Okay? Okay? I get it. If you say no, it's still bad. Yeah, we're not asking your help. <laughs> no, but the point is, I want you guys to start seeing things in a spiritual dimension. When you come over here, 
you know, you just see here, but it's not just here. Because the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, tells us clearly, there's a lot of angels here, you know, go back and read that chapter, and you see what is really going on in a Sunday service. So you start seeing, like, Elijah, okay? when you come into troubles, when you enter into difficulties, don't just look at yourself. Just Don't just look at the situation. You can see what's beyond it, what God is doing. But besides, we are the untouchable. We are the untouchable of God. We're living it. We're not just, just talking about the, the word, but we're living it. And that brings us to the third point, is to give life. The power to give life. We read it real fast because of the time. Okay. You yourself are our letters, written in our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are the letter of, from, from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablet of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our confidence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministry of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. That is a really good scripture if you want to remember. If you want to be a ministry of God, especially those who want to be a ministry of God, uh, the Word, you know, this is one of this uh, scripture you should recite more and more. Because people think that it, I go everywhere and people say, Jesus, bless the Lord, and, talk, and it really drives people away. Because Christianity is not some kind of information. Okay? The Word of God is not just some kind of information. Sometimes it's very annoying when I see somebody, they thought they're very gun ho for God and you know, for the gospel. Everybody, they see, oh, love God, oh yeah, praise the Lord, and you should not do this because the Bible do this, Bible do that, and people don't care about the Bible, you know what I mean? And they always put Jesus and Bible and God and this and that, you know, around them. And for them, they, they thought they are preaching the gospel, or reaching out. But what he is telling us is not the letters, the letter kills. It's the spirit of the letter that gives life. Besides, Christianity is not just telling you about the Word of God. The Word of God is very important. But it's not just the Word, but not the letters of the Word. It's the spirit of the Word that transforms you. And then when you walk out, you have that charisma. Because your life is being transformed by the Word. You know, it's almost like you are what you eat. You keep eating the words and you grow that kind of muscle, grow that kind of strength in the spiritual world, and that is what gives life. It's not just people just talk, talk, talk about God. And sometimes it gets really annoying. Okay. So we don't hear us always talk about God, but you know, through our living, through our, the way we fellowship, through the way we act, through the way we help people, help people through all our attitudes, you, know, you can see it's a biblical attitude that shines. So the Word of God has to shine out through you. You know, in a way that is the spirit of the word and not just the letter itself. Not just the dry old information about, oh, Jesus Christ died for you on the cross. So it's very important to understand the concept. Okay? Just because you always talk about Jesus doesn't mean that you are really shining or preaching gospel. It's the spirit of the word that he carries. And uh, that was really funny. The other day I was in the gym and I hear two guys talking. I think it's really funny. Take it like a joke. So this guy, both guys are talking simultaneously. They're talking in Spanish. They're constantly really, really like, like something very dense is being said because they are not talking slow, they're talking fast. And the other guy is talking. They're talking like this for three minutes. Talking and listening at the same time. And uh, I, was, I was looking at them like, okay. You can really talk to each other. How come you don't pause and listen or, you know? <laughs> there are so many things in this world said today. It's, it's pointless. If you count your whole day, that's a lot of things that you said is pointless. But what my point is, the word of God is not by ink. It's the spirit of the word. You want to be a man that is filled with the spirit of the word. And then you have the power to give life. Oh, since this sermon is so serious, I'm going to give you guys one joke. 
And this joke is very funny. It's a real thing, real situation. Interesting, interesting. So there's this pastor. Uh, he is a quote unquote pastor. Uh, he he wants to try out living a life of, of an atheist, like no God. And the reason he does that is because he was fired from his church by doing some misconduct thing, and the church cannot accept him. And he's getting so liberal, right? And doing all kinds of bad things. So the church said, Oh, I really had to, we had to kick you out. So he said, Oh, since I'm kicked out from the church, I don't have to worry about, you know, you know, complying with that law and stuff. So I have a chance, I will take this opportunity to try out how to live like a person with no God, like an like atheist. And he has a lot of supporters. He said, a lot of supporters would say, whoa, you know, this guy is very smart and it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing things that you can get a different try a different kind of option, you know. You've been a Christian all your life and now you have a chance to try to be a non-Christian and see how it feels, you know. Isn't that the jokes? <laughs> I think it's very funny. This should be put in a Christian joke or something. It's a real thing that happens lately. Okay? So, <laughs> how can you try out to be non Christian? If you're non Christian, you're non Christian. You have to try it. <laughs> but if you're a Christian, then you are a Christian. You can do nothing but a Christian, right? It's not like, like you can consider it. Try to be a non Christian for a month <laughs> and tell us how it is. We like to hear it. And my wife was saying that it's almost like asking you, you know, try, to be, try to be a cat. <laughs> try to be a cat for a month. <laughs> okay. So, you want to be untouchable? I really want to be untouchable. And I, I kind of feel that. At this time of my life, this point of my life, I am pretty much like that pastor. Not in the gangster way, but you know, in this Christian way. <laughs> it's very hard to touch me, it's very hard to hit me, it's very hard to hurt me because there's like, you know, serious armor of rounds. So let us all pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to understand your law. It's not a cold, hard law, but it's a decree that is showing us, revealing to us a path to please you. We really want to know what pleases you. We really want to get down to the nitty gritty of the Lord is to hear exactly what you want us to do and we will do it. As the Israelites have said, that whatever God said, we will do it. And Lord, let us live out that law, not just in the ink, that written on the stone, but it's a spirit that written into our heart. And let us live out that life-giving life where other people touches us. They will touch the spirit of the world. Lord, if we can do that, we can have a heavenly perspective and see things like no others. And that's why the men of God, they act and think differently because they see things differently. And Lord, we want to see we want to see things clearly from the point of view. And the word of God will teach us how to do that properly. Lord, we thank you for giving us this meeting. And as quiet, as casual as this meeting is, Lord, we know in a spiritual dimension, the awesome God, the Mount Sinai situation is happening among us. And we give you all the glory and honor. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. But um, this we.